normal psychology book. It's really kind of fascinating uh, how these things have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. You wouldn't think they would, but they do. Uh, this, of course, is Edvard Munch and his famous uh, painting or lithograph, the, the scream. What does it have to do with schizophrenia? Oh, he was having a psychotic breakdown. He wasn't, but the, pic the guy in the picture theoretically was having a psychotic breakdown when he saw all the blood in the sky. Uh, schizophrenia and psychotic disorders represent severe forms of psychopathology, usually labeled as psychoses. Psychoses uh, involve a loss of contact with reality. So that's the basic premise of, of uh, uh, schizophrenia. It's the basic premise of any psychotic uh, episode is, uh, is loss of reality. The DSM-5 includes several psychotic disorders. It, it has changed. The DSM-5 changed from the DSM-4 TR, which was the last uh, DSM manual that came out before the DSM-5. Um, <clears throat> so they've changed the way that we look at this stuff uh, in the DSM-5, and it will probably continue to change. The most, the, um, the most uh, well-known of the psychoses is schizophrenia, <clears throat> of course. Uh, we, uh, another type of psychosis is uh, bipolar disorder. But we won't talk about bipolar disorder until the next chapter. Psychosis is a loss of contact with reality, of course. Uh, individuals who suffer from psychosis lose their ability to perceive and respond to the environment and are not able to function at home with friends, in school, or at work. And if you've ever been around somebody with schizophrenia, if you knew them before they were had a psychotic episode, <clears throat> then you know that these individuals cannot function uh, in, in, in the normal world without medication. And usually, even with medication, uh, the amount of uh, interaction that they can that they can tolerate is, is relatively small. They may have false sensory perceptions, uh, which we refer to as hallucinations, or fa false beliefs, these are known as delusions, or they may withdraw into a private world. <clears throat> Once upon a time I worked in a rural health clinic in Oklahoma, uh, Chandler, Oklahoma. Uh, right next door to Chandler, Oklahoma was the Sac and Fox uh, tribal land, but that's not neither here nor there. Uh, there was a there was a ranch right outside of Chandler uh, called the Agape Ranch, and these individuals brought people in from all around the country uh, to live in a rural setting uh, who were suffering from uh, some of them were suffering from intellectual deficits, uh, other individuals were bipolar, some individuals were schizophrenic. Uh, in, in, uh, anyway, they were they were living in the Agape Ranch. And from time to time, since we were the closest medical facility, we had a clinic there. There were actually two clinics in, uh, in Chandler. Uh, we had one of the clinics. Uh, they would bring their, uh, some of these individuals in, and we would, uh, we would take care of them, do whatever we needed to. Usually it had to do with uh, drawing blood to make sure that their medication level was OK, that they weren't accumulating a toxic level. Uh, a lot of these medications that people take for mental illness are accumulative and they will build up in your system. This really kind of can be a serious problem. So what we, what you need to do, and it, they also can destroy your liver. Uh, so we would draw, draw a liver function tests on these, these individuals. And we would draw a, a, a test to determine how much of the medication they have in your system. Uh, and there were a number of them. It was really kind of interesting. Uh, there was this one guy that would come in, and he wasn't, he was kind of, he's about my height, but he probably weighed twice as much as I did. Uh, this individual was suffering from schizophrenia. Uh, we knew that he was suffering from schizophrenia. Uh, he was on medication, so everything was fine. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that uh, schizophrenia, schizo the, medica the antipsychotics uh, that we use for schizophrenia, uh, one of the things about that medication is that it uh, really messes up your muscle mass. Uh, so it makes your muscles relatively uh, uh, flaccid. Uh, they're, they're really spongy. Uh, they're not very strong people, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. So they, um, these are kind of, kind of very, these are very weak people. They tend to be very weak people. Okay, so we've got this guy who weighs twice as much as I do. He's about my height. Uh, he's about five foot six. Uh, working at the place was a guy that had been a, a lineman for the Northwestern uh, Wildcats. 
didn't know anything about the book about Northwestern. It's a Big Ten school. Uh, they tended to recruit very, very bright people because it's one of the top schools in the country. But they also had a fairly good football team. And this guy was had been a lineman, and he was all shoulders. Uh, he was huge. The guy weighed in the 300 pound range, and he was all he was all shoulders. He was a very powerful man. Okay, so one day uh, we, uh, <laughs> one day they called up on the telephone and they, they said, "We got, uh, we're bringing uh, Rufus in." Uh, Rufus was the guy that was all the, the, he was a schizo, the individual suffering from schizophrenia. We're also bringing in uh, Jared. Jared was the football player. Uh, Jared, uh, Jared has been injured. They said. Uh, we were we were asking stupid questions like, were they in an automobile accident? What happened? As it turned out, and of course we didn't get the story until uh, they both uh, showed up at the uh, clinic. But what had happened? Uh, Rufus had decided he wasn't going to uh, take his medication. He became quite paranoid, and uh, so he stopped taking his medication. Uh, and he was hiding it under his tongue, and then he was spitting it out afterwards. And of course, so he wasn't getting proper antipsychotic medication. Uh, so eventually what happened was that he uh, became, he had a psychotic episode. I mean, that's evidently what was going to happen. Um, and the reason he wanted to come to our clinic was because he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to talk to me. Because potentially, uh, I, he knew that I had been in the military. We had that conversation at one point uh, during the time that uh, he was coming in. Uh, so he wanted to talk to me because so that I could uh, uh, so that I could help him. Uh, he, he needed to communicate with President Reagan, and he knew that anybody that had ever been in the military has a direct line to the president. Obviously, don't they? He's, he's on my speed. He's on my speed. Yeah, I, 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 I've been accused of knowing everything the CIA is doing. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Rufus. So Rufus wanted to come into the clinic so he could communicate with me so, because I had been in the military and obviously I had been Oh, is that the one you guys transferred? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I've already told you guys this thing. Well, anyway, he beat this thing. The crap out of, uh, uh, out of Jared. He just beat the crap out of him. His lineman, he just threw him all over the place. <laughs> this guy with no muscle mass whatsoever, off his medication, he was, he was like a superhero. And he'd throw this guy through the wall, he threw him through a two by four fence. Uh, he threw it, oh, geez, he, they just destroyed the place. And Jared came in and he was messed up. He had, he had like seven broken ribs, well, six broken ribs. Uh, six broken ribs, he had a concussion. Uh, of course, nothing happened to Rufus. Uh, but uh, Rufus came in and of course he wanted to communicate with me. He had his, his aluminum helmet on. Uh, and of course, eventually we, we transported him out. But the point was that he was delusional. And the reason he was delusional was because he went off his medication. We are talking about schizophrenia today. So uh, probably today and, and uh, on Wednesday, we're talking about the, the, the psychoses. And of course, that was his problem, was the, the fact that he was psychotic. Uh, he had gone off his medication. Uh, unbeknownst to everybody, and he had a psychotic episode, and of course he needed to talk to me. Uh, and of course they were afraid to bring him in because they were afraid that uh, that he would have another psychotic episode, that he would go off on me. Uh, but the reality was, as soon as he saw me, he was the psychotic episode ended. I, you know, it was like it was like I laid on hands and he stopped the psychotic episode. But that's not, certainly not what happened. <laughs> It was the fact that he thought that I could communicate with Ronald Reagan. Of course, Ronald Reagan was dying of Alzheimer's disease. Wasn't the president of the United States anymore. This is during the, the uh, this is during the uh, Clinton administration. So uh, yeah, but he, he thought the president was Ronald Reagan. Is this when Nancy Reagan was the president? Yeah, Nancy was the president. No, this is after he left office. Actually, it was act not only after he left office, but Bush was out of office, and it, and Clinton was the president of the United States at this point. But he wanted me to communicate with President Reagan. <clears throat> anyway, okay, so psychosis uh, not only uh, can be uh, genetic, but it also could be in, uh, induced by select medications, uh, such as LSD, amphetamines, and cannabis. Strangely enough, marijuana uh, can lead to, uh, and I, I looked this up again, 
you know, everybody's going, well, you know, marijuana, it's not bad. It's legal, legal in 10 states. It's not a bad medication. It's not bad. It's not a bad drug. It can't hurt you. Well, the reality is it's a hallucinogen, and it can kick you into to schizophrenia if you have that proclivity. Uh, just like LSD can, just like amphetamines can, just like cocaine uh, can kick you into psychosis. Uh, injuries or diseases of the brain may induce psychosis, but most commonly psychosis appears in the form of schizophrenia, and it doesn't have anything to do with a medication, and it doesn't have anything to do with a brain, uh, brain injury. <clears throat> One aspect of psychosis is a tendency toward loose, disjointed, uh, yeah, disjointed expressions, uh, derailment of associations where the, the two trains don't seem to go together. There's dis de disrailment there, derailment there. Uh, cognitive slippage where they're thinking about something, they're talking about something, then all of a sudden they can't remember what they're talking about. Tangentiality where the, uh, the, uh, the information doesn't uh, seem to mesh. And word salad where they're just throwing out words that sound good to them. But the two, the, none of the words go together. Intruding associations may sometimes be highly personal and result in speech that is egocentric or autistic, and in extreme uh, instances, almost totally unintelligible. And if you've ever had a conversation with somebody who's a schizophrenic, understanding what the hell they're talking about is. Uh, yeah. As uh, you mentioned, uh, methamphetamines and marijuana and drugs yeah. like that. When someone's high and they're hallucinating, has anyone ever diagnosed that? Label that as a psychosis episode, temporary. No. So it's, it's temporary. So you know, you know, label it. So like, you know how like some people say someone was temporarily insane. Yeah. And that's a legal defense. Yeah. Yeah, that will work. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> if you do something you shouldn't do, whether you were drunk or whether you were blacked out, it doesn't really make you going to be charged with it. Temporary insanity is rarely. A defense of words. It hardly ever works. As you will learn when you take psychology and law. People try to use it, but it just doesn't work. Almost never works. Uh, mainly because people don't want it to work. If you do something, they want they want you punished for it. So uh, who's the guy there? Who's, oh, the, uh, the kid down in Florida. You know, uh, the, the kid in uh, uh, Colorado. And Aurora, that just that shot up the theater and killed, I don't know, it killed a lot of people. Uh, 20, 20 different doctors have diagnosed him with schizophrenia. So what's going to happen next? Are we going to let him go? This guy took a, an AR-15 and put a 100-round drum on the suck, 99-round drum, one in the chamber of 99. And shot up the theater. Are we going to let this guy out? What about like, crimes of passion? Crimes of passion. You're walking on your wife or your husband cheating, stab, going to stab and scream. <laughs> Trying to hit everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Anything moving, you hit. Uh, rarely, rarely. You'll you'll still go to prison. You'll you'll still serve some time. Probably. Not. Temporary insanity doesn't really, it's a legal term, it's not a, psych, it's not a psychological term. It's not a medical term. <clears throat> Sentence structure or syntax is not impaired with these select individuals. Uh, there's no uh, uh, evidence of educational or intellectual difficulties making communication ineffective. Instead, the content is unusual and the meaning seems to be lost. And that this is the biggest problem that we have with these individuals. The DSM-5 distinguishes between loose associations, shifts between clauses or topics or referential frames, and incoherence where it shifts there are shifts within clauses so that the clauses don't make any sense. And we're going to talk about some of them right now. Word salad, a collection of words seemingly thrown together and tossed like a salad before presentation, and it's impossible to understand what the hell they're talking about. They're just throwing words together. Sometimes they'll use words that sound good, but they don't mean that they don't mean anything. And this is known as is clanging, where they, they just will repeat and they, they rhyme a lot. This is will drive you nuts. They're, they're just constantly rhyming. 
uh, the, the rhymes don't make any sense. Uh, neologisms, uh, new words invented by the speaker, often by combining existing words. Uh, what did somebody use? Somebody used the word the other day, and I didn't have a clue what was going on. Coolness. Coolness. <laughs> no, the word. The word was shart, and I had never heard. I had never heard of it. Shart. I had never heard it before. Sarah explained to me what it meant. I didn't know. I was. I didn't know. I'd never heard the word before. Don't do it. Sports. 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 A skirt and and no, short. No, no, sport. Like spoon and. Oh, is it spoon and <laughs> It's a portmanteau. Where you put two words together. I guess that's what short means. Too. I know. I never heard the word before. There was a guy whose name was short. That's how it came. I don't want you to think we're having really strange <laughs> conversations. But his Medical name term. was Shart. <laughs> and of course, his name was Shart. And I, I went, okay. I didn't, I didn't know what <laughs> I never heard the word before. <clears throat> then I found it on the internet, and then I understood it. I know. She's, she said, look it up. You know, that kind of thing. I guess this is a word from the 80s or something. I don't know. Yes, I didn't know what Shart uh, to me, it was a ne neologism. I thought she was just making something up, like she would. Elogia is impoverished speech. A means not, and logia means speech, no speech. Uh, Hypermetaphorical speech is a form of, of overgeneralization where they just keep creating these metaphors that don't make any sense. That'll drive you crazy. Echolalia, where they repeat everything you say like your baby brother did back when you were, you know, five years. He was five, and you were eight or whatever and he repeated everything that you said just the way you did it and you would say something like I'm stupid and then he'd say I'm stupid <laughs> or that's when you could get into stuff repeating what you said delusions are extreme uh, convictions firmly held in spite of incontrovertible uh, evidence to the contrary delusions are distinguished from ideas by their fixedness uh, there are a number of subtypes of delusions not mutually exclusive. Sometimes you can have more than one uh, stuck together. Bizarre delusions are false beliefs that could not possibly be true, given what it is known about the world. And of course, that was what was going on with the individual that came in. He wanted to talk to me so that I could, he knew how to, to create peace in the world. Uh, he had gotten the information from aliens in outer space. They had given him that information. And that was his delusion that he had information that would save the world. And he wanted me to get it to the president, who was not really the president at the time. But if I had been able to uh, see, and he never gave me the, he never gave it to me. <laughs> I was hoping he would give me the formula for peace in the world, but he never did. And we put him on the helicopter before I got the answer to all, all of the wife's questions. <laughs> Yeah, just a bite. Anyway, delusional jealousy is incorrect conviction that a person's spouse or their sexual partner has been or is being unfaithful. Uh, this causes a lot of murders. Uh, these individuals uh, will have delusional jealousy. Uh, they're having a psychotic episode, and they just assume that their partner is has been unfaithful, even though they have no proof. It's just it has been developed in their That's brain. A delusion. It's a delusion. It can be, yeah, if it's not true. You know. Erotomanic, uh, erotomanic uh, delusions are patently false beliefs that another person, often someone famous or of higher status, uh, is in love with the individual. Uh, this is what happened with John Hinckley. John Hinckley tried to assassinate President Reagan. He really did try to assassinate President Reagan. He was trying to impress Jody Foster. Jody Foster uh, was in the movie Taxi. Uh, he identified with the uh, with the Robert De Niro character. Uh, he fell in love with this 12-year-old prostitute, whatever the character, I don't remember the character's name, but it was Jodie Foster. Uh, he quit his job in, uh, where was he, living in Virginia. He quit his job in Virginia. Uh, Jodie Foster was going to, to Yale at the time, and he went up to Connecticut and uh, started living in uh, what, wherever Yale is. Uh, anyway, he would visit her, and he'd write her poems and slip them under her door. I know. 
crazy people on the East Coast. <clears throat> that's sane. What, what, and what is that called? Erotomania. You think that's duplicated in uh, third world countries with, because uh, they don't have TV and movies, but they have religion? Who they fall in love with Jesus? Cut characters and different deities and become priests and priestesses. Hmm. Well, we, we hate to call any kind of religious fervor delusions of, of any kind, one kind or another. I mean, we don't really want to do that because I mean, those are belief systems. So but I mean, you, it could happen and then be mistaken as being devout, but really they're beliefs that might be delusion. Oh. Which was the point of the movie uh, Inferno by, by uh, Brown, Brown, what's Brown? Mm -hmm. Dan Brown, that's a good thing. Dan Brown. Yeah. The point was that uh, this guy was wanted to be the Pope, uh, and he tried to create a situation where he could potentially become Pope. He was only, I don't know, in his 30s or something. He didn't want to do that. That's, that was a kind of uh, I don't know. I'd rather not say yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was just thinking, like, um, <laughs> I may think that all religions are. <laughs> I was thinking how peculiar this is to, to the United States or industrialized countries right. that might be recognized, but then maybe if it's truly a, a disorder, it would also be um, prevalent in unindustrialized countries, and then how would it show up? And more prevalent. Yeah, and how would it show up in those countries? Uh, potentially, you're right. Uh, and, and like I said, the problem is we can't, we try not to attack religions because people have really strong belief systems. I don't, but other people have really strong belief systems. So, uh, yeah. Uh, there was that was a, there was a case of John Hinckley in uh, in Washington D.C., uh, which is okay. I mean, this guy's writing her love notes, um, and then he did, he actually identifies with the story so much. If you read, if I've never seen the movie Taxi, but I understand Robert De Niro's character decides that he's going to murder somebody so that. Uh, so that this 12-year-old prostitute will fall in love with him. So he, and John Hinckley, of course, did the same thing. But he was talking about Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster was older now. She was in her teens. She was in her tw early 20s. Uh, evidently, he wrote a letter saying something about, I'm going to make you notice me. And if you had watched the movie and understood that this guy was going to assassinate a politician, uh, Robert De Niro's character, then you would understand that he became a danger. But at what point? Do, at what point do you stop this guy? While he's writing love notes to Jodie Foster, is that okay? Can you do that? Is there a law against that? Should he have a gun? Should he be allowed to to to, uh, to have a, a weapon? Is there any law in the United States that we can take a weapon away from someone? Or can anybody in the, in the United States own a gun, a handgun? Or an AR-15 for that matter, a, a military weapon? Something else that Sarah and I were talking about the other day. <laughs> at what point do, can you tell this guy that, at what point do you identify him as, as such a danger that you can actually take his guns away from him? What do you have to do in order to take his guns away from him? What does he have to say in order to make you do that? So I told you about the guy that on the on Facebook he said he's going to shoot me the next time I go to Indiana. Can I? Should I call the Indiana State Police and tell them that this guy said he's going to shoot me the next time I come? come to Indiana, so I want, him, I want you guys to take his deer rifles away from him. He's a deer hunter. That's all he does. He's a retired postal worker. Why are they always so violent? <laughs> What's going on? At what point can we say, take his guns away? I mean, this is what they were saying after, after Parkland, right? After the Douglas shooting. Oh, I believe the gun, but it's not the gun that's going to shoot you. It's the guy that's going to pick up the gun. And if he doesn't have a gun, he'll get a knife. Or he'll run over you. You know, there's all kinds of ways. Yeah, but okay. <clears throat> so let, let's pretend that he's got a knife, all right? 
<laughs> We're in a room this size, all right? Now, how in the world, how in the world am I going to keep them from stabbing me? Get a gun. I don't need a gun. Use a chair. I could use anything to keep him from stabbing. But if he's got a gun, what's the probability I'm going to survive this encounter? If he's got a gun. If you're outside, the car is just as just as dead. Not if I run behind a fence. Not if I run behind a tree. <coughs> not if I run behind a rock. But if he's got a gun, then a rock will stay. You're behind a big enough rock. If I'm behind a big enough rock, and he doesn't come around. It. I think. Kind of getting uh, caught up on what he's going to kill you with is not as important as the person. I think it is. If he's got an AR-15, if he's got a military weapon, and he's got military rounds on, then I can kill everybody in this room from the corner. If I've got a knife, I've got to go up to everybody. I have to keep him in the room for one thing. I have to go up to him with the knife. But if I've got a, if I've got a gun, I can kill everybody. And I don't have to get anywhere close. They just ran over a bunch of people in England. They did it in Vegas too. The lady got mad. She ran over a bunch of people. In Same thing happened down in Florida. Actually, more people, get people get killed by vehicles get run, getting run over than by AR-15s. More people get stabbed. More people get killed by hammers than by AR-15s. It's not true. It was true up into 2016 FBI statistics. <laughs> FBI and CDC. <laughs> We're talking about fewer incidences. Though, we? The other problem that we have is that we're not really uh, communicating uh, gun violence because it's against the law to accumulate, accumulate that information. Alcohol, because alcohol and vehicles combine criminal people. That's fine. I agree with you. We should outlaw alcohol as well. It didn't work so well last time. <laughs> yeah, it worked great last time. Right? So what's my point? What's my point? Wait a minute, i got to get back on time. Uh, erotomania. Erotomania. So, uh, oh, so he took a gun out of handgun. So the question is, at what point do we take that gun away from the gun? That's the question. That's what they're talking about now. We need to take the guns away. We need to identify these people and take the guns away from them. Because it could happen, well it did, it happened up in Aztec in New Mexico. It could happen. It could happen here. If you've got a knife, I'm not nearly as afraid of you as if you have a, uh, a weapon with, I don't know, 13 rounds in it. I can, I can't take a knife away from you. <laughs> Well, I could probably take a knife away from the little kid. <laughs> but if he's got a gun, well, I told him. No, I didn't. You, you haven't heard the story about the kid that put, put the pistol on my chest. I, I think taking the gun away is the wrong approach. I think if you really want, because uh, my argument is valid, that they can pick anything up and, and hurt you with it. So Potentially, I think, but you I, but can I think kill you, people with a gun. And well, you can kill people with a knife. You, you can, can but you have to get really, really close to them. And you have to hit well, the if right they wanna, spot. If they want to kill you, they're going to kill you. So the, maybe the right thing isn't trying to just zero in on one type of weapon that they can use, but rather <clears throat> if they get to that point where they're going to be a threat to somebody, maybe they need to be locked up. Right. And how? what is that point? That's the question. That's what we were talking about the other day. In, in countries with, uh, with fewer weapons or fewer guns, they don't have the, nearly the murder rate that we have. Yeah, but like in Britain, they're throwing acid on people because they don't have guns. It's I'd rather get shot rather than get acid thrown on Well, I would rather not die. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's one or the other, I'd rather get shot <laughs> than have well, acid thrown The on. Russians are injecting people with, with uh, uh, nerve agents and killing them. In, in, in England. That hasn't happened in the United States yet. Uh, so what are we doing? Oh, okay, so we had this case in uh, at Purdue University in uh, Indiana. Um, the, uh, this, this very important uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, professor died and uh, the, the librarian took like, weeks off and then we could figure out what was going on. It turned out that she had never actually talked to this guy but she had fallen in love with him. His signature 
because he signed his cards when he checked out books. And she had fallen in love with him. And she had this, this uh, uh, area in her house that was dedicated to his memory, to, to him. And so she was madly in love with this guy, even though she'd never had a conversation with him. She was afraid to talk to him. She would stand behind him in the lunch line and follow him and just look at him. And whatever he, he would uh, get put on his plate, she would put on her plate as well. Erotomania. They had to institutionalize her after he died because she was so distraught. And are, are most people who suffer from that now? No. Is it it's pretty human? Yeah, I think so, if I'm not mistaken. The, the only reason I ask is I had a friend of mine who was a bouncer at a strip club. And he said that they had <laughs> people who would, uh, that, that exact same, in their mind, they had built up that there was a relationship right. with, with one of the dancers. Right. So they would have to walk them out right. to the car because they'd be hiding in the parking lot exactly. and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just, uh, after I, I thought about that, I thought about other instances where it had to happen. It's always the woman that has to be walked out because a man's hiding somewhere. Right, right, you know, right, yeah, potentially. Yeah. To, to do whatever. So what do we do with this guy? Do we arrest him for stalking? I guess stalking is a, is a law now. It used to not be a law, but it is now. Since the 90s, I guess, 80s and 90s. So it's a law now that you can't do that. You can't follow somebody around them. You can't steal their mailbox. I mean, you can't steal mailboxes anyway, but I mean, you can't steal their, their mail out of their mailbox. This is so bizarre, isn't it? Well, and she had to be institutionalized. She never came back. That's how bad she was. She was grieving for this man that she had never spoken to, but she had all of these things that he had touched. She ate the same food that he did, or you know, but she had never even talked to the guy. And so she had to. They had to retire. Her, of course, she had. Uh, she had a mental breakdown. And that was. That was it. So where where is the uh, exact line from having a crush on somebody, being infatuated with someone? There you go. And going into being uh, delusional. Neuronomatic delusions. We're talking about schizophrenia here. We're talking about a, a, a loss of reality. And that's the difference. Uh, if I can still function, you know, I'm madly in love with Moe's. I can't control Moe's. <laughs> I, I live for Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> 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 I can't look at her because I might, you know, I might not be able to speak. Exactly. <laughs> if, if I'm still functional in society, then, I, then I'm okay. But if every time she comes into the room, I become non-functional. I'm re I lose reality. Now I have a, a, a lot of manic uh, delusion. So a crush is one thing, but if they can't function anymore, uh, there was the movie The Bodyguard. If you've ever, you know, the movie about the movie Houston. What about like, yeah. girls that pass out at concerts and they see somebody here on stage and they're not functioning anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just passed out. They just <laughs> yeah, they start crying, you know, emotional. And <laughs> uh, we have uh, an entire nation of legal erotomanic <laughs> <laughs> uh, delusions, <laughs> including my sister. She would uh, she would scream so much at a, at a concert that she would lose her voice. She'd pass out. This is a field concert. <laughs> and then she would come home to listen to their music because she didn't hear anything while she was at the concert. concert. She'd follow these people all over the United States. Well, as much as she could. We lived in Indiana. So if they went to Indianapolis, she went to Indianapolis. If they went to Chicago, she'd go to Chicago if they uh, had a concert in Cincinnati. Of course, they were only active for, what, seven years? And then they broke up. The, the Beatles. So the, there is a difference. There's a difference. One is you're non-functional, and the other is that you're still functional. But you uh, you just have a a massive desire to be or be around these individuals. And it kind of sounds like with the crush, obviously you have that affection for that person. But then with this, it's like do you believe that they are they actually, actually love you. Yeah. yeah, they know who you are, and they love you. Yeah, that's the difference. So is that different? She claimed that, that, that she got him, he got her pregnant and she had an abortion. This lady at Purdue. Does it have to have a, a romantic notion to it or can it be platonic as well? In her case, it was totally platonic because she never had sex with anybody. She claimed that, that he had uh, impregnated her and they, they had carried on this long love affair. 
the reason I was asking is because I was just thinking about like, uh, some people who get that way with politicians. That they're willing to die for people they've never even You know, like if you go back to Hitler, yeah. a lot of people were willing to kill on his behalf and, and die for him, and they never even got to. Were we him. willing to die for our country? And then, no, we're talking about a person, not an idea. Right. Yeah. And then, even if you look at like uh, with the last election between Hillary and Trump, there were people that were just hardcore on both sides. Right. That would just, keep, no matter what reality you shared with them, they would just totally just blow it off. and. Like they, were, they weren't functioning in reality anymore. They were, they were I knew people that hated Obama so much that they would. I was afraid that they might do something. Yeah. I was thinking of calling the, the, the uh, Secret Service and telling them, you know, I got this friend of mine that he claims that, that he hates Obama so much that he would assassinate, if he had the opportunity, that he would assassinate him. And of course, this guy's a hunter, he's got, he's got all kinds of rifles, he's got a sniper rifle for no reason whatsoever. You can't hunt with one. What the hell is he doing with a sniper right? But you know, he's just a gun collector. So is that the same thing then? Because it's not a romantic connection with somebody. But no, it's no. not the same thing. No, it's not the same. Thing. Is there something that covers that, or is that something that's not under the abuse of fun? These people don't lose reality. Uh, well, some of them might, but uh, you know, it, it's very rare when you see situations like. They, they don't think that this uh, that, that Adolf Hitler is in love with them, that he knows who they are. Okay. And that's the difference. Okay. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So it, it has, you have to have this idea that they know, they not only know you, but they secretly are, are infatuated with you as much as you're infatuated with them. So in their mind, they build up a relationship. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you're, they're giving you as much as, as you're giving them. They think of you as much as you think of them. So can they do that with... People who have passed on there too, dead people. Wow. I imagine it's possible. I, I would imagine that individual would just die. Uh, would just quit and die. So we don't really see it that as much. We do see. Well, uh, this is relatively common that married couples, as soon as when one dies, the other one dies for almost no reason whatsoever. Very yeah, so that may be a, a very similar situation. But of course, that's not a delusion because yeah. because they really didn't come from, or they like them that much. I guess fascinating, isn't it? This stuff is fun. Grandiose delusions are grossly inflated self-importance, fame, power, wealth, or knowledge. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, we got a lot of cases of individuals who thought they were Jesus Christ. They thought they were Jesus Christ. It was more than anybody else. It was not General Westmoreland. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, who was president at the time. Nixon. It wasn't President Johnson. Uh, it was Jesus Christ. They thought they were Jesus Christ. And they, the proof that they were Jesus Christ was that they were praying to Jesus. And they shouldn't have survived something. Something happened, and they shouldn't have survived. And they were reborn as. When they came out of the crucible of combat, they had, had been reborn as Jesus. And it was really kind of interesting, uh, these individuals that you run into from time to time. So is this is like the same as like David Koresh? Uh, David Koresh. Waco, Texas. I'm, you know, I'm not exactly sure what his thing was. I'm not exactly sure how what his connection with Jesus was. I guess he thought that Jesus had sex with 14 year old girls. You know, David Koresh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Or Jim Jones down in Guyana. Yeah. I'm not sure what his thing was. His thing was, um, <laughs> Jim Jones is from, was from a, a town about 25 miles down the road from where I, from where I was born. And he's like only five years older than I was. Uh, I played baseball. I played, I ran track against Jim Jones. You always say his character. He's a girl <laughs> He was from Cadiz. <laughs> uh, I know, really kind. Of, I know, really kind of interesting. Uh, these individuals don't. Uh, they think that they're, they're somebody that they're actually not. Uh, used to be Napoleon, uh, but now it's I don't know. Maybe it's Donald Trump. I don't know. Maybe people want to be Donald Trump. <laughs> mood congruent uh, delusions, when entirely uh, consistent with expressed mood, uh, involves content that is inconsistent with the prevailing mood. 
Uh, if one has uh, was depressed, the belief that one's body is rotting would be a mood congruent delusion. So whatever you're thinking, uh, the uh, the delusion has to be part or can be part of that. Sometimes it is uh, uh, negative. It's a, it's a negative uh, congruent, uh, unlimited. Uh, it, it's mood incongruent. The belief that one had unlimited power and and, and wealth, of course, if you're uh, not happy, and that would be mood incongruent. Do, do some of these delusions do they coexist like more than one at a time? Yeah, yeah. You can have you can have more than one. Delusions of being uh, controlled is the belief that some external force or agent is manipulating one's movements, thoughts, speech, or emotions, and that's one one of the reasons why Rufus would wear an aluminum hat. Uh, so that the aliens couldn't communicate with him because he, they were controlling his behavior. Delusions of reference or false beliefs that events, people, or things in the immediate environment have a spatial and unique significance for the individual. A lot of times the, these are things that don't have anything to do with anything. Uh, there was a case of the individual that, want, that walked around. He had disorganized schizophrenia, what we used to call disorganized schizophrenia. But he walked around New York following arrows. And if an arrow pointed this way, he would follow that until he ran into another arrow. And then he'd follow that arrow. Until he ran into another arrow, and then he would turn and follow that arrow. Arrow, thinking, of course, that God or... But it was a sign. And it was a sign from God. <laughs> and this guy's walking all over the place. And you know, finally, they, the cops picked him up, and they took him to, the, to Bellevue. And then we were, yes, sir. So would people who were... Uh... <clears throat> claim to be psychics or people who follow psychics who can follow these these two no. no no they because well <laughs> I don't know they get signs from other things really, but it's not true well, wherever it's not who, who painted that arrow on the ground you know, God did uh, obviously so that he tell me which way to go that's delusion if you're a psychic uh, if, if hope comes into me and I'm a psyche, then I'm reading her facial expressions. I'm, I'm, I'm getting cute, uh, cues from her. She's telling me what she wants me to say. That's what a psyche does. A psyche, a psyche reads that person. They're not getting messages from God. They're getting messages from the person that's sitting across from them. Have you ever treated anybody that was that kind of have psychic abilities? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what do they suffer from? Well, delusions of one kind or another. <laughs> Usually, it's a delusion that they that they can communicate with God. Yeah. So that is, that, is that the same as communicating with, with aliens? Does that fall on the same level? Well, the aliens, of course, they're. I don't know. This is a question of religion. <laughs> oh, it's too close to religion. Yeah, it's too okay. close to religion. Okay. We can't really talk about religion because you know you've got most of your. Uh, Actually, the, the reality is, and I hate to tell you this, but uh, this is this may be an old figure. So there may be a lot more religious people in psychology than there ever than there have been in the past. Uh, but the, the number of atheists in psychology is in the eighty percent range. That's a lot. <clears throat> and the reason that they were practicing a religion was because, and the reason they've gone into psychology because they were. Uh, sometimes religion is the problem. So it's hard to be religious and to deal with people's religious delusions at the same time. How does the Catholic Church approach it? They're psychologists. The uh, Catholic Church, uh, their priests are trained uh, for pastoral care, which is the same thing as counseling. So that's how they, they approach it. Their, their priests are counseling. But most most people in psychology uh, have have no belief, have no strong beliefs. In I can say that. some of them do. I mean, is it because it's mostly the field is based on empirical. It's me trying to help you right now, and I can't tell you to. I you know first of all I have to figure out what you believe in before I can tell you who to go see, uh, how how to pray. You know, they're. If you're a psychologist and somebody is hurting, you, are, you going to go, are you going to tell them, go pray? That'll work. That always works. It works every damn time. You know, that's not. 
no, no, my job is to, is to talk to this person, find out what their problem is, and try to help them. Try to change their, their way of thinking. So from just like a, a, a scientific view, just from, um, how, does, how does psychology view uh, psychics or people that have, claim to have the ability to speak with aliens or with God or spirits? Do they think it's delusional? Well, it can be. It probably is. I mean, that's why we're here, just to try to help you. And if you are delusional, is it a delusion or, or are, you, are you really Jesus Christ? Well, the probability that that's true is fairly remote, right? So this is a tough one. This is a, you know, this is part of the argument that comes up over and over and over again. You know, the whole the whole question of religion. And one of the things you need to find out from this individual is: Have you dealt with your spiritual leader? Have you dealt with you know the church? Have you have you? Have you sought succor from those these individuals, and have they failed you? And if they have, then then we can work. Then I, you can work with me. I can work with you. But if you know if you're if you're going to be arguing with me as far as your religion is concerned, then we can't really do anything, right, Moses? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. he <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here, Moses. <laughs> Oh, what are we doing now? Persecutory <laughs> delusions are where the theme is of being plotted against, attacked, cheated, threatened, or per persecuted in some way or by uh, other various people, uh, people or groups. Uh, the reason that Rufus came in was the reason he stopped taking his medication was because they were trying to poison it, whoever they were. And uh, Jared, who was the football player, was one of the people that were trying to help him. They were trying to give it, they were giving him pills. He was one of the people giving him pills. He was one of the people trying to feed him food. The food didn't taste right to him. It didn't have enough salt in it, or maybe it had too much salt in it. They were trying to kill him. He knew that. He, it was very obvious to him that they were trying to kill him. Somatic delusions are false convictions that concern the body. Uh, thought broadcasting delusions are delusions that others can uh, hear or receive one's thoughts. That's why he had the aluminum on his, his hat, his aluminum hat. Who would have thought that aluminum foil was such a protector against, <laughs> against thought control? Thought insertion delusions are, are that uh, some external person or agency is inserting thoughts into one's consciousness and of course, that has that's also has to do with delusions of control. This guy was feeling that he was being controlled, and that they were communicating from out, communicating with him from outer space. And he he didn't put on his aluminum hat until he had the answer to world peace. And as soon as he had the answer to world peace, he put on his aluminum hat so that they couldn't communicate with him and mess with him anymore, because he knew that he had this piece of information. You think I'm kidding. He had this piece of information that was so important to the world that he needed to control it. He needed to be in control of that. And of course, people were trying to poison him. Is, is that to like a, a lesser degree the same thing that happens with some athletes when they put on a helmet and they become a different personality, they assume a different kind of more aggressive personality? Wow. That's, that's, that's self-hypnosis. And that's, you know, it's a totally different situation. It's not a psychotic situation. Hopefully it's not psychotic, yeah. unless they've been taking steroids, then possibly it's a psychotic situation. <laughs> False sensory experiences, uh, the world may seem flat, unreal, or remote to this select individual. Objects seem unusually large or un unusually small. This, of course, is an advertisement. This is a NASCAR driver that... He's like three inches tall, and this guy opens his hood, and he starts talking to him about putting a new additive in his car. This is, you know, this is a joke with the, with a monster rooster, I guess. Uh, anyway, time passes uh, with unusual slowness or rapidity. Hallucinations are sensory experiences for which there are no in identifiable external stimuli. Okay. All right. Auditory, so now we're, we're going to talk about uh, hallucinations instead of delusions. Uh, auditory hallucinations are the mo most common type of hallucination. It's where the individual hears voices. He hears somebody talking to him. 
Uh, I don't know about you, but I spent the weekend all by myself, uh, and uh, there were people talking to me the entire time I was this for this whole weekend. People, it was me talking to myself, okay? <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, I was thinking about something. And when you think about something, you hear voices. Don't you hear voices? Kind of. Have you ever awakened at night somebody with somebody yelling your name and you woke up and you couldn't find anybody yelling your name? Is it around? It's never happened to you? Never. So what's the difference between talking to yourself and singing to yourself? <laughs> singing to yourself. Well, for one thing, I can't carry a tune. Uh, for another thing, I can't remember lyrics. So for me, it would be impossible to uh, sing to myself. But I, I talk to myself all the time. Sometimes I talk out loud to myself, and that's, that's scary. Is it scary for us? So, is this not uh, a delusion? Is it not a delusion if it's uh, something like sleep or food deprivation? Uh, sleep deprivation will can cause auditory hallucinations. You start hearing voices. Um, so, what are you hearing? Well, you may be hearing the memory of somebody speaking to you. Is what you do. I mean, there's there's a lot of different reasons why this. But if you can't tell the difference between reality and and, and uh, reality and unreality, then now we got a problem. Now we got a serious problem. If you're hearing voices and thinking that Jesus is talking to you, then potentially you got we got a problem. I, I, I've seen people that sleep deprived before, where I knelt down before a tree and tried to put a dollar in the beginning of the coke machine. <laughs> Get up and walk why off. is it always a tree and why is it always a coke machine? <laughs> and I've seen people get up and walk off thinking they're, they're following another group of people and there's nobody there. There's, there's nobody there. Hey, 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 it's it's always well, that's not really fair. It's always the person that drinks the most. If you, have you ever noticed that? It's the it's the one that, that gets really snogger when uh, when they're not on duty. Have you ever noticed that? They're the ones that have the most hallucinations and delusions. So their brains are used to not creating their own reality. They're used to living in the reality of, of alcohol or, or drugs, whatever, whatever they may be playing. Uh, I had a friend that was a, uh, that smoked a lot of pot. And I'll tell you what, when, when we were on duty, he was always the first one to go. He was always the first one to, to, to freak out on something. But he was also the radio, radiation or the uh, x-ray thing. So that may have had something to do with it as well. Think about it. I'm trying it's to all, it's I'm trying always to like <laughs> in the military, like everybody drinks heavily in the army, you know, in the infantry, or those kind of I, I would say venture to say that So with everybody's happy. That everybody is drinking more than their peers in the okay. civilian sector, more okay. often, binging more often than even in college students. So I, I don't know. The only time I've really seen it is when I was in the military during training, during good good student prime, and when I was in Iraq. We'd been up for three days at a time sometimes. People would start uh, driving down the road, they would start leaving. Right. Because they yeah. think they see something, they're like, you know, hey, what exactly. is it? Or they'll say, what? What? I'm like, huh? You're saying it. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I saw cherries. Saying, you saw cherries? I saw cherries. <laughs> we, were, we were doing convoy and sleep deprived. And I was driving and it was a sandstorm. We could barely see in front of you. So we had to keep our animals kind of close. And I was kind of following this vehicle in front of me and it was at night. And it was still hazy at night. And the sands were blowing into me. And I, I don't know, I just saw some cherries come on. And I was like, oh, there are cherries right there. I guess they put their grapes on. Yeah. You know? And I don't know, I don't know, it's like that, you know? Cherry pie. How perfect would that have been? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about it. it it's, oh, always the, it's always the heavier, heaviest drink. And just as I've been back, I do, I have seen um, all the veterans talk about them. Uh, seeing things like when they're in the house, when they pass their window, when they're walking the window. Right. So they like to black it out. Right. You know, and they're usually drinking too. Yeah. Yeah. Things move really fast past the window. Yeah. As soon as you, you turn your head, you can't catch it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's very common. Uh, sleep deprivation. That's sleep deprivation. That's where the hallucinations come from.
Tactile hallucinations are illusions of being touched or having something just beneath your skin. And of course, this has to do, we're talking about schizophrenia here. So these people are really suffering. Uh, so these individuals think that they have, somebody has implanted something under their skin and they can actually feel it. It hurts them and it moves. That's the bizarre part. So if I, if I were to touch somebody's hand and move my finger across your, your arm, is that me on the is my, is it my finger on the outside or is there actually a uh, something underneath that's moving? And actually, that's all it takes is the the feeling of movement. So it would all it would take would be for your hair follicles to stand up. And when you're scared, what happens? Your hair follicles stand up. The first thing that happens. So it feels like movement. So it feels like there's something under your skin. It's them not being able to tell the difference between reality and unreality. And that is schizophrenia. The individual may engage in strange stereotype gestures, postures, or facial grimaces referred to as catatonia. Uh, there, we used to call a special type of uh, schizophrenia as catatonic schizophrenia. And it was individuals that had these problems. Uh, catatonic immobility is where the individual ceases body move, bodily movements uh, altogether. And this individual will, will freeze in a select position. Uh, that's what's going on here and here. These are both individuals suffering from uh, catatonic immobility. Uh, catatonic excitement is where the individual is wildly excited, violent, or displays unpredictable movements. Uh, waxy flexibility is where they're mostly stiff, but you can move them. So that's waxy flexibility. In other words, if I'm like this, and this is my catatonic position, I can move that arm down. And now, and now I'm like this. I can move this arm down. Now I'm like this. That's waxy flexibility. Uh, echopraxia is where the individual imitates the movements of others. Echopraxia. Uh, the DSM-5 has added catatonia as a specifier defined by the presence of at least three catatonic symptoms for other psych uh, psychotic disorders, other mental disorders, and other medical conditions. In other words, we don't have catatonic schizophrenia anymore. Uh, the DSM-4TR did, this, uh, the DSM-5 doesn't. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you so much for reminding me. <laughs> Catatonia associated with another mental disorder. In other words, if you have a catatonic episode uh, with, uh, with depression or with uh, uh, anxiety or whatever. Catatonic disorder due to another medical condition where you have a brain injury and of course you're catatonic or unspecified catatonia. And that's what I had the other day. I, was, I got home and I was so tired, I just sat there in my car. And I didn't move for like 10 minutes. Of course, the dog's barking in the house. <laughs> and you're the one that's making the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the same as when people have like, dreams and they get realized. That's paralyzed. That, it's not sleep well, that's, yeah, but that's already. That's, that's because you're not already. In already, you can't move. You're, you're paralyzed. So it's not so the same. It has to do with being in REM sleep. Try to wet the bed when you're in REM sleep. It can't happen. You can't, you can't relax your sphincter to uh, allow yourself to do that. Urinate uh, the bed. Uh, flattened effect is characterized by a lack of ranges of emotions. Emotions are swallow, uh, uh, shallow, flattened, or blunted. Uh, and hedonia is a lack of enjoyment in all aspects of life, so you can't find any joy in anything. Inappropriate emotions are emotional expressions with no clear relationships uh, to uh, a relationship to events in the social environment. Inappropriate emotions, and of course, uh, uh, who was it? Camus wrote a book about an individual that uh, was being uh, uh, questioned by the police, and he had inappropriate emotions. And because he, his mother had just died, and he wasn't sad. And because he wasn't sad, they arrested him for murder. Yeah, because he didn't have the right emotions. Anyway, he was inappropriate. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a novel. But inappropriate emotions are relatively common with individuals suffering from schizophrenia. Uh, they're happy when they should be sad. They're sad when they should be happy. Uh, they're showing emotions when there shouldn't be any emotions shown. They're not showing emotions when they should show emotions. Uh, so if somebody dies, you're supposed to be unhappy, right? What was I watching the other day? Oh, I was watching uh, the, uh, uh, Is, Izzy Ole. I, I, he was a, uh, a ukulele player over in 
Hawaii. I don't know if you know Izzy. He's the one that sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yeah. Uh, he died at, at a relatively young age, like age 30. And um, they cremated him. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. They took the jar and they, uh, and they and they poured it out into the ocean when he, you know, because he was Hawaii. And they were celebrating his life, so everybody was happy and they were kind of me, and me, and me. Oh, you know. no, I was Is that inappropriate? I was thinking about what you were saying about being flattened, right? right. Inappropriately, uh, right. he was that. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, flattened is no emotion at all. Okay, but like you know, when people are in. Uh, in a war zone for a prolonged period of time and they're fighting against other people. They get happy when they kill other people from the inside. You know, and then when they start getting as far as start mutilating people and stuff like that, you know, like, it's really just bizarre to someone who's sitting here right. in say you leave, but yeah. right. if you're uh, downtown or right. Baghdad, you know, it can get really grim one. Well what would you think of somebody that uh, would kill somebody and have no emotion, right? I have I've seen a lot of that. You know, that's what I was saying. In the There's no zone, reaction whatsoever. Yeah, in the battle zone, I've seen people do that. Now we got a problem. This guy's not showing any any emotions. He's got flattened emotions. Now we got a problem. As long as he's happy, or as long as he's sad, or if he shows some emotions, we're okay. But as soon as he stops showing emotion, not reacting to it, what potentially might may happen next? If he's not reacting to to something like like killing someone or mutilating someone, he has no expression whatsoever. So what if it's done out of like conditioning like this? How you're taught to well, that's what is that di is that different? Well, yeah. Like if you have to be disciplined after right, but you're still ha you're still feeling emotion. You're still showing emotion. As soon as that emotion stops, as soon as you stop having emotion, what's going to happen next? This is one of the reasons why we're worried about these individuals that, uh, that uh, are doing these school shootings, the guy that killed 57 people in Las Vegas. This is why we're worried about this. How in the world did he, why did he feel something to the people when he was shooting? You know, he were wounded, what, 800 people? But he can't some emotion because he got scared enough to kill himself, right? He did when they, when they knocked on the door. Or assuming he, he killed himself out of fear, but I, mean, I don't know what. Well, we, yeah, emotion. we don't know. But that's emotion for himself, not necessarily right. for, for, for other individuals. He feels no empathy. So did he suffer from antisocial personality? So when people stop showing emotion, and this is, of course, the worry that we have with all these video games where you're shooting zombies in the head and killing them. Or you get numb to it. You get numb to it, exactly. Yeah, and we, once you get numb, now we got a problem. Because we need you to think about shooting somebody. I know that sounds horrible. We need you to feel something. We need you to think about it. So what if you've just already pre... If a person makes a decision to they get to a point where they know they're going to have to deal with it and they just already have to make it, it's calculated, and so they don't get as emotional. Uh, like debriefing afterwards? Like they know they're going to have to go in right. and, and, and fight, so they, t they kind of prepare prep themselves mentally. Right, right. So that they can do it. Yeah. But they still have emotion. They still have feeling. Okay, so that's different than... That's yeah. totally okay. different. Oh. Okay. From, the, from flattened emotion means they have no emotion whatsoever. Okay. It's like, how in the world could that kid have gone into the Sandy Bar and killed 23 three, uh, uh, teachers? Well, killing adults is not that big a deal. But he shot six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. He shot first grade. He killed 23 first graders. How do you do that? What can possibly be going on in your mind? Well, we can we can talk about this being, you know, he, he was obviously mentally ill, but the, the real problem is, I mean, he had flattened emotions. Did he learn this from playing video games? Did he not think of them as, as living human beings? And this is a problem. This can potentially be a problem. Because when you come back to the world, and I understand how combat works, but when you come back to the world, you need to start feeling for, for other individuals, right? I mean, you have to, otherwise you can't. Then you start suffering from yeah. PTSD, and you separate yourself from everybody. Yeah, that's why I guess I was asking, because I know some veterans, that, uh, a lot of guys I know, they, uh, they had a hard time turning it back on. Right. Uh, right. 
you know, right. because it, they put themselves in a mentality to do their job and then they come back. Right. And then it was just one day you're in and one day the next day you're at home with your family. There's exactly. no because you have a big prep up into combat. There's exactly. a lot of training and everything. Sure. And you don't just go in like one day you're here and one day you're there. It's a lot of training that goes into it. But when you come back, it's just they just the drop The next you. day, you're boom. You're with your family and your kids, and they don't have that time to exactly to flip that switch. And a lot of people have a hard time turning back on. Exactly. Some people, I've known some people that said they haven't cried yet since they came back. Yeah. They just they, uh, anytime they start to feel emotion, they will just cut it all off. Right. And they'll go numb. So My totally brother hard. had to kill people with his knife. With knives, he he would ambush people. He had to kill people with a knife. So he would go out and ambush. You know, units that were coming to ambush him, he would pick them off. That guy, you know, he would take the back and kill him. And then he would kill as many as he could before they figured out that he was actually exterminating their squad. Uh, tough, tough job, as you can imagine. I mean, that that was. But you know, he felt them dying, and he had to he had to hold them until they were dead to keep them from from making noise. An odd, an odd thing I don't know, because I don't know the numbers off this, but it's just an interesting observation for myself. But you take all these veter millions of veterans who fought in Africa, Afghanistan, with that many people back here in the population, we don't have that many people killing other people. A lot of the, the killers that are getting the, a lot of the notoriety now are youngsters. Right. That haven't had sleep deprivation. Or right. So I guess people who are really sick, it's not something else inducing it. Is it more like nature over nurture? Do you think they were, they were born that way, or do you think they got conditioned that way? I think they, well, uh, the, the, the guy that shot the, the people in the uh, apartment, uh, evidently he had a gun fetish. He was attracted to, to guns. So he, was, he shot BB guns. They, the neighbors watched him and they were scared of him because they were afraid he was going to pick up a gun and start shooting people. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Picked up a gun and started shooting people. So, I don't know. I don't know. Was he conditioned? Did somebody not stop him when he started going off the deep end? We don't know. And at what point do we can we identify that person as going off the deep end? I mean, that's the question. That's the question I was asking before. When can we take the person's guns away from them? <clears throat> yeah, we got to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Let's lock them up. You can't <laughs> shoot anybody if they're locked up. It's easier. Uh, don't let's still achieve the same goal. <laughs> we have. They have to do something before we can lock them up. They have to break the law before. And you we... have to do something before you take their guns away. So it's just easier. right. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's easier to lock people up rather than take their Second Amendment. Uh, well, we'll see because that's what that's what Trump has been talking about, taking guns away before, with, without. Uh, well, we'll see what happens. It's it's going to be interesting. I'm sure he's going to back down anyway. He's not going to do it. Uh, schizophrenic individuals tend to avoid close interpersonal relationships. They spend much of their time alone and retreat more and more into their own fantasy world. And because of this, of course, there's not a whole lot of interaction taking place. Um, this is why we're afraid of these individuals. This is one of the reasons I was afraid of what was going to happen with my brother, because he kept pulling farther and farther away from people. But luckily, my parents were there, and my parents uh, kept him grounded, as it were. He didn't, he didn't uh, gr go into his, fantasy, in, into his fantasy world. If, we, if you go to my brother's house right now, my brother lives in Rome, in, in, in the house, with the dog. He lives with the dog, and a cat. I guess there's a cat there. But if you go up to his room, it looks like his hooch back in Vietnam. It's decorated exactly the same. He's got he's all, all, all of his his blankets are, are army blankets. He's got his helmet is in the middle of the floor. He's got his weapons over in the corner. I know. It's kind of spooky, but it's been 45 years. I know. He also I told Start you. My room. <laughs> he also built rifle pits all around the all around the property to protect the property with with uh, clear fields of fire. 
I know. That's weird. That gets real weird. That's not weird. It's efficient. That's efficient? <laughs> no, That's it's tactical. not. <laughs> uh, I don't think I don't think any Viet Cong are going to attack <laughs> Muncie, Indiana, anytime soon. It could happen, I guess. <laughs> the withdrawal is both the physical and psychological, of course, and the psychological aspect is is worse than the physical withdrawal, the psychological withdrawal, because they don't feel like, like they can communicate with other individuals. There is no uh, assumption. Uh, that these disorders share a common cause, a common pathway, or even a common fundamental set of symptoms, although discussed together in the DSM-5. We talk about a spectrum. We talk about a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. Uh, and in that spectrum uh, uh, is uh, schizotypal personality disorder and schizoaffective uh, 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 disorder, personality disorder. The schizotypal personality disorder, of course, is part of the schizophrenia spectrum but in the DSM-5, it's put in the personality disorders. Psychotic symptoms can appear transiently during periods of stress in individuals with many different conditions and do not in themselves verify the presence of a psychotic disorder. Symptom patterns and degree of impairment may differ for select individuals. The reality is we're looking at a lot of different, any individual will have their own different form of schizophrenia. And this is, the tough, this is why it's so tough to diagnose. So if I have schizophrenia, and Moe's has schizophrenia, thank you for having schizophrenia with me, <laughs> Her schizophrenia is going to look completely different than mine. For one thing, I'm a lot older. I'm twice as old as she is. Maybe three times as old as she is. Well, maybe not that old. But uh, we're, I'm older than she is. So uh, the way that I develop my schizophrenia is going to be totally different than than her uh, way of developing schizophrenia. And we can look at all the different types of schizophrenia, any individual, and we can see a different trajectory. Uh, not only did it start in a different place, but it's going a different place. And this is the problem with diagnosing schizophrenia. We're talking about unreality. Remember, the human brain wants to be fixed. The human brain doesn't want to suffer. It doesn't want to be depressed. It doesn't want to have anxiety. It doesn't want to have schizophrenia. So it tries to fix itself. And that's the reason that despite the fact that, that our schizophrenia may have started out exactly the same, that her schizophrenia is different than mine. For one thing, she's a lot younger than mine. So her schizophrenia is going to be completely different than mine. She's also, uh, she's also American Indian. And because of that, she may uh, adhere to her, spiritual, her American Indian spirituality. Whereas I don't because I, I'm a godless. <laughs> yes, sir. So, in, in a way, our schizophrenia or similar in that way then to like having dreams, it would be different for each person based on different things that, that you've been exposed to. You know, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, dreams are very similar to schizophrenia because when you're in a dream, you think it's reality. Exactly, and you have no control, you have no way of controlling what's going on in your in your mind. Yeah, exactly, that's a good point. Right. <clears throat> so, can dreams drive you crazy? <laughs> Yes. No, well, they they can represent uh, in, uh, schizophrenia taking over. They can they can uh, uh, represent hallucinations and delusions. They can feed into your hallucinations. And delusions. You don't think maybe it's just a person dreaming that part of the mind took over? Oh, well, that's an interesting point. I don't think we've ever dealt with that before. That's that's an interesting point. It's a possibility. I don't know. I don't know. This is a tough one. Uh, psychologists that deal with schizophrenia usually don't deal with anything else. They don't deal with depression. They don't deal with with other things. They specialize in schizophrenia. This is a tough. This is a tough field because these individuals remember they don't live in, a, in the real world. Their brain tells them that what their brain is telling them is reality, and but nobody else can identify with this reality. Because there's a weird point too. Sometimes when you're having a dream and you wake up and you're talking about. It. And you think it's still the dream. It right. takes you a while to kind of come out of it. Right. But how long does it take you to come out of it? Not that long. A probably. second? A couple of seconds. A microsecond? A couple of seconds? Or sometimes you'll be dreaming and you'll wake up, you go to the bathroom, come back, and hope you can get back into your dream. And sometimes you actually can. You can go back to your old dream. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> that's my favorite part. <laughs> hot dog. Okay. That's hot. Ah, uh, what are we doing here? Okay. All right, all right. I know where I am. 
Psychotic disorder due to another uh, medical condition is another uh, criteria from DSM-5. Uh, it's many medical conditions can produce psychotic symptoms. Neurological condi conditions such as multiple sclerosis or epilepsy. Uh, hypothyroidism can cause uh, schizophrenic episodes. Metabolic conditions, fever, and nearly any other central nervous system disorder. So if you get a blow to the head, you can have psychotic symptoms. If you have a high fever, you can have psychotic symptoms. You can lose reality. Uh, substance medicated, uh, medication induced uh, psychotic disorder is another criteria. Uh, a variety of substances can produce hallucinations, delusions, verbal incoherence, and other psychotic behavior as a direct result uh, of use or upon abrupt withdrawal, of course. Uh, LSD, cocaine, uh, methamphetamines, uh, uh, even marijuana, as, as uh, natural as it's supposed to be. Approximately one out of every 100 people in the world suffers from schizophrenia during his or her lifetime. An estimated 2.5 million Americans have schizophrenia. Sufferers have an increased risk of suicide and, phys and of physical, uh, often fatal illnesses. These individuals have a, a, a uh, depleted immune system. This is the reason that they suffer from illnesses more frequently than other individuals. This individual will not live as long as other individuals mainly because either they will commit suicide or they will contract a disease. They normally die of pneumonia because their immune system is so weak. Uh, so this can be a problem. Uh, suffers, okay. Um, people suffering from schizophrenia attempt suicide at a high rate, uh, mainly because of uh, the, the reality that they're going through. Their brains are not telling them uh, that they uh, it, it, it doesn't feel good. Suffer, suffer, suffer. They're suffering, yeah. So they, they try to commit suicide because they're suffering. We need to stop right here because this is uh, it's time to leave. <laughs> but we'll pick this up next time, and I'll get through schizophrenia. I promise. Psychosis. This is.